All right, what I'd like to do is revisit um, the anatomy of our time domain thermoreflectance signal and um, in the process show you why it's such a big deal to make sure that none of the pump light that is heating up the sample makes it back into your photodiode. Why is that such a big deal? Well, let's walk back through um, the anatomy of our, of our signal. Let me grab my laser pointer here in case I need it. Um, all right, so in step one of our TDTR, we basically created this laser output that was a train, a pulse train, of pulses at 80 meg coming out at 80 megahertz. Um, we split that those pulses into pump and probe at a polarizing beam splitter, and then for the pump light, we modulated it. So we basically turned it on and off at high speed, usually about 10 megahertz, but it doesn't. But you control it; it can be any frequency you want, I guess. Um, and so we've got periods of on and off. Then we use the probe beams to actually try and sense the temperature on the surface of the sample. So each one of these pump pulses is creating a temperature spike on the surface of our sample. And um, over time, that each one of those temperature spikes decays. Um, the sensing pulses come in essentially all the time. Uh, they're not modulated the same way that the pump beam is. And so sometimes when the sensing pulse comes in, it senses one reflectivity associated with a higher temperature. And sometimes it senses a lower reflective or a different reflectivity associated with there not being a temperature spike during these times. And so um, if we pick up our reflected probe signal and bring it back to our photodiode, we'll get a signal that has one intensity while the pump beam is on and a different intensity when the probe beam is off or when the pump beam is off. And so there's a very slight difference, a very, very small difference um, in those intensities that occurs at the modulation frequency. And what we do is we use a lock-in amplifier to try and detect those, um, that very tiny signal modulation. Now, just to remind you, that signal modulation is basically about the same size as the, well, it's the same size as the percent change in reflectivity. So remember that the reflectivity is only changing by one part per 10,000. So actually, this picture is very, very exaggerated. Those little fluctuations that are happening are only about one ten thousandth or one one hundred thousandth of the actual total height of that blue stick. Um, so they're very, very tiny. However, imagine what would, okay, so let me, let's go back to our pump beam, right? So our goal is to get the probe beam back to this photodiode. And the way that we prevented our pump beam from getting back was essentially that this polarizing beam splitter here will redirect the pump beam back towards the electro-optic modulator, just based on polarization. Um, now, funny thing about that, polarizing beam splitters are only about only effective to about one part in 200, or if you buy a really good one, it might be as good as one part in a thousand. Um, but that means that there's one part in a thousand of our modulated pump pulse that actually keeps going towards our photodiode. And um, if we don't make any effort to do anything, it'll land on our photodiode. Why is that a big deal? Well, okay, we're trying to detect a modulated signal at frequency 10 megahertz, but there's something else in the signal that is modulating at 10 megahertz. It's our pump pulse. Our pump pulses are modulating at 10 megahertz and they're not modulating a little bit. They're modulating all the way from the very top of their intensity all the way down to zero. Um, so, you know, whereas these, this detector signal might only be changing one part in 100,000, the pump pulse is changing 100%. Um, and so, um, if that pump pulse makes it back, even if even a little bit of the pump pulse makes it back to your photodiode, the photodiode or the lock-in amplifier can't tell the difference between a large signal due to a pump pulse and a large signal, you know, a large fluctuating signal due to a probe pulse. It can't tell. It, all it knows is that some intensity landed on the photodiode, and if it's a large fluctuating intensity at the frequency that I was looking at, it's going to read that as signal. The big problem here is that that modulating pump pulse is actually not a thermal signal. Um, it has nothing to do with the temperature fluctuations on my sample, and so it's basically a false signal that will ruin data analysis.
Um, and so we need to make some pretty significant efforts to make sure that that does not happen. Um, we cannot allow pump beam to make it back to our photodiode. If even one part in a million makes it back to our photodiode, that will affect our experiment because one part in a million is about the level of detector signal that we would like to be able to detect to have an accurate measurement. So we really need to do a good job at not allowing pump beam to get back to our photodiode um, for that reason. And so um, there are a couple of different methods that have been developed to try and prevent um, the pump beam from making it back to photodiodes. I'll walk through a, at least three of them. Um, two of them appear in picture, oops, appear in pictures here. So I, I have yet to talk about these optical filters that are in my picture. That's called the two, these are called two tint filters. And these are a way of exploiting the optical spectra of our laser to prevent the pump and probe from making it back to the photodiode. These are highly effective. Um, a second method is an optical, like a mechanical chopper, or sometimes called an optical chopper. Um, I'll talk about how that works um, in a separate video, but that is another method that can not just detect spurious pump, leak pump light, but can detect other sorts of spurious electrical signals that might get into a lock and amplifier. Um, a third thing which is not shown on here are a, a, a cleverly designed set of apertures. I'll show that in a separate video as well. But there are a, the, the main point is that you need to be very careful about making sure that there is no pump pulse making it back to the photodiode. Um, there's a simple way, by the way, to figure out whether any pump light has made it back to your photodiode or not. Um, when you're doing an experiment. And this is always something you should do when you're setting up a TDTR experiment. Block your block the probe beam. If you block your probe beam, but your lock-in amplifier still sees a signal, then guess what? It's not a real signal because your probe beam never even hit the sample. So um, if, you, if you block your probe beam and you still see a signal, you can quickly figure out whether it's a, like a leaked pump beam or not. And in fact, you can determine whether it's a leak pump beam versus some other mechanism by also blocking the pump beam. So if you block the pump beam, the probe beam and the pump beam and you still see a TDTR signal, guess what? That has nothing to do with a laser at all and it's some kind of spurious experimental signal. Um, and usually that's called coherent pickup. But uh, anyway, so but it's very important to keep track of these things otherwise, um, you know, you can end up with faulty data with this method. So the, the, the two tint and the two color method were specifically designed to exclude pump light um, from making it to photodiodes using two different strategies.